All right, let's hope this is working. We're going to find out. I'm going to pull up YouTube on the side screen, and we're going to see what's going on here. As long as it's recording, I'm happy. Hey, we're recording. All right, let's hope this. There we go. I think it's working. What do you know? Um, hey, so this is, we're going to tur turn us back on the camera here. All right. So, hey, this is Brent from the Armchair Dragoons, and welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you here with us at the ACDC, hope you're having a great time this weekend. Lots of great gaming going on. There's actually some folks starting right after this that are looking for some players over in the Ad Astra Games area for Squadron Strike for the Space Combat game. So if you want to go from Age of Gunpowder, Colonial Forts, all the way up to Space Combat, we can do that for you. It's not a problem. Um, today, coming back, Jim, you are our one and only three-time speaker for our Dragoons conventions, um, which I think means you're more gullible than anybody else, ah. really what I think that comes back to. So, um, no, Jim is a fantastic dude, great war game designer, but also a fantastic historian who has a, a great knowledge of military history that he doesn't mind sharing with us. So uh, Jim is here to talk about forts at the forks of the Ohio. And with that, I'm going to exit the broadcast. I'm going to let Jim take over here. But Jim, as questions come up from the audience, I will feed them to you. Will do. Okay, well, thanks, Brent. A uh, topic for today is one that I've been interested in since I was a small child, really, uh, living in Pittsburgh virtually my entire life and looking at its colonial history. In fact, the first historic site I ever went to, my parents took me when I was five, we went to the, by then, not too very old Fort Ligonier rebuild um, at near uh, well, in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, near the World Board Gaming Championships in uh, Champion, PA. And it got me hooked. And I've been interested in this all my life. And um, those of you who may have attended previous uh, online talks that I've done with Armchair Dragoons, um, I have a thing for forts. I'm not an engineer, but for some reason, I keep on going back to forts in military engineering. So this is really kind of in my wheelhouse. So today we're going to talk about the forts at the Forks of the Ohio, also known as Pittsburgh. And for this area too, it's also known as the Point. And where the forts were is now occupied by Point State Park after many decades of it being really an industrial slum. Uh, it was rebuilt, it, well, everything was torn down in the 50s and rebuilt in the 50s and 60s with uh, a park at the center of where Pittsburgh started with archaeology looking at the forts as well. So let me get started here. There were several roles that all the forts on the frontier played for both the French and the British around the 18th century and specifically in the French and Indian War. First of all, these were points of interaction with the Indians. They traded with the Indians through forts. They conducted diplomacy at forts. And very, very important was the matter of gifts. Both kingdoms would try to maintain favor with the Indians through gift giving. It wasn't just bribery, although that was part of it. The Indians came to depend on the European gifts for their own cohesion and for their own diplomacy and um, political standing among their people. Chiefs would get gifts of guns, uh, food, gunpowder, ammunition was extremely important, and then they would give that to their people, cementing their own status within the tribe. At the same time, the Europeans were gaining favor with the chiefs, and the Indians came to depend on it too because they needed the gunpowder and the ball ammunition to hunt. They needed this in order to live both for food and to take deer. And they would trade the skins with the Europeans. So they were dependent on the gifts and the Europeans were dependent on gift giving to keep the Indians happy. Another thing is it's basically a stamp of control. Here's my fort. We claim this land. This is ours. It's evidence to rivals. You have a fort here. It's like, we're here. We're committed to stay. We're not going away. And it's also a commitment to one's own side. We see this with the French, especially, that 
it energizes, it motivates the defenders to go out and fight. And we're going to see this repeatedly with Fort Duquesne. They're military bases, of course. They protect lines of communications. Not so much in Pittsburgh, because this was the end of the line of communications. But the other forts leading to it, coming down to Allegheny, Fort Proskiel in Erie, PA today, and in Waterford, uh, Pennsylvania, the French Fort LeBeouf, in Fort Michaud in what is today Franklin, PA. These were all French posts that supplied and maintained communications with the forks of the Ohio. On the English side, you had Fort Ligonier and Fort Bedford and Fort Cumberland, Maryland, especially, that these were stations on the way that protected communications with Fort Pitt and also with the uh, British expeditions to take Fort Duquesne. So there's a very strong logistical role here. There are also bases for operations and raids. This is especially true of the French and including at Fort Duquesne. They would launch raids with French and Indians uh, from the forks of the Ohio that went as far as Eastern Pennsylvania and South Carolina during the French and Indian War. These are offensive bases, not just defensive posts. And the, the French-Canadian way of war was very, very strong on guerrilla warfare, raids, asymmetric warfare, we would call it today. Not so much stand up and fight like Montcalm tried to impose upon them. Uh, very irregular. And the forts played right into this. And Fort Duquesne was a very important one. And so, too, was another post up the, the Allegheny River, uh, Catanning which the British, actually Swiss, Colonel Henry Bouquet called that nest of vipers, that these were areas that the Indians at French instigation and leadership would use to raid further east into Pennsylvania and then south into the Carolinas. Also physical defense, not just as a base, but a physical presence that had to be taken by siege or through some other difficult maneuver operation. But I'll say that this is probably one of the least important functions, and it's one that they performed least well, at least at, in Pittsburgh. Now, the French had a series of very defensible forts in 1754 throughout Canada, the Niagara region, um, coast, the um, Ontario, uh, Lake Ontario, both in Ontario and New York today. Quebec, of course. If you've ever been to Quebec, it's the only intact walled city in North America. Um, that was not taken by siege. That was taken by more of a conventional operation, sometimes remembered as a siege, but it was not a conventional siege in the way that Vauban would have recognized. Montreal, Louisbourg, which is pictured here. You see it as a masonry fort on a on a uh, harbor. This is um, analogous to the British base at Halifax, Niagara, and uh, at the mouth of the Niagara River and Lake Ontario. Another large, um, another large post that was taken by a conventional European style siege in 1759. Carillon, later remembered as Fort Ticonderoga, and all were built to defend against a more conventional European attack. Niagara is really the only one that you would say was on the frontier. The rest of them were um, positioned that they would be attacked more by the, the British and the Americans, and they were the points at which these long logistical lines really started, Niagara being the exception. But even that, Niagara was really the base for operations down the Allegheny into Pittsburgh in the Ohio country. Now, the first fort at Pittsburgh was called Fort Prince George, also known as Trent's Fort. And this was the site of a trading post at the point that had been... Uh, trading with the Indians through the 1740s. 
It was run by a guy named William Trent, who was an Indian trader, worked with the Ohio Company. And he was ordered by the Virginia governor, Lord Dinwiddie, to occupy the forks of the Ohio in a way that would show British ownership. Here we have the planting the, the flag function, as well as trading with the Indians, which he had been doing anyway. He built a small stockade fort at the point, beginning construction in January 1754. This was such a small post that there are no contemporary drawings or architectural renderings or anything of it. It was basically a hooch with a ring of palisades around it. Think of Fort Necessity. And it was never finished. These Virginians were driven out by the French under Claude Pierre Picaudi de Contracourt on the 18th of April, 1754. And they established Fort Duquesne. Now, the functions of Fort Prince George were to plant the flag to show ownership of the start of the Ohio country. It was a trading post for the Ohio Company, as well as, of course, for William Trent, a point of contact with the Indians, who were the trading partners. It was not defensible. In fact, the French took it very easily, basically, by showing up. Kind of like what happens with uh, some pirate games with the opposition, but that's a whole other presentation. Fort, Trent's Fort, Fort Prince George, was replaced by the much more famous Fort Duquesne, which was functional from 1754, really through 1758. But 1759 was when the whole British position in the Allegheny, Ohio region really collapsed. It was the keystone of the French presence. This is the end of the line for the lines of communication coming down from Lake Erie down the Allegheny. And the, the most important part of that, the in the end, this is where they dealt most with the Indians. It was located at the end of these lines of communication, which made supplying and sustaining it more difficult. It was the locus for interacting with the Indians. And it was totally inadequate as a defensive work. When you play war games, a lot of times you see this represented, say, in Will and um, ah. let me turn around here, take a look. Uh, wilderness War. You see it in Wilderness War as a major fortification on a par with Quebec or Niagara. And this is really not true, at least as far as physical capabilities go. Maybe as far as French determination to defend Fort Duquesne, but in terms of physical presence, it was weak. It was of wooden construction with earth filled west and north bastions and curtain walls and simply palisades on the south and east. It was also tiny with a parade ground about the size of a tennis court, totally dwarfed by the later British fortification of Fort Pitt and utterly inadequate. So what the French did, they built a second fort. This was needed to accommodate assets that could not be contained in Fort Duquesne itself. And this was basically a elongated rectangular palisade with some buildings in it. Um, and at this point, I would say against artillery, palisades had little or no ability to withstand anything. This was another case of Build it, they show up, fort's gone. So I'd like to present to you here what is really the most important rendering of Fort Duquesne by one of the officers there, Francois de Mercier. And this is this what was found in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And it gives you some idea of the design and not so much about its size, but it was tiny. And if you see the two little lines going into the Monongahela River on the right side, and at the bottom, another line going into the what they call the Ohio River, but it's really the Allegheny. Uh, those two little lines, uh, one of them is the only one 
that is still extant today. The only thing that is ever found by geologists, it, or I mean by archaeologists, and what it is, it's a drain for a latrine. That's all that's left today. And all that was left after the British got done. Here's a drawing of uh, Fort Duquesne with the second fort to the top um, left. We're looking south here across the Allegheny. Uh, the drawing is by Charles Moore Stotts, who is one of the most important scholars of the forts in Pittsburgh. Uh, Charles Stotts was not an historian so much as he was an architect. He oversaw the construction of Point State Park. He also um, did all the research and the planning for the reconstruction of Fort Ligonier. It is, and at it, while he was alive, he was probably the most important authority on the forts of Western Pennsylvania. And if, there, if you get one book to start looking at this subject, I suggest his book, Outposts for the, of the War for Empire. It's a little hard to get now. Uh, I believe it's now out of print for about the fourth time, but it's contain, it contains these wonderful drawings of all the forts, not just in Pittsburgh, but up and down the Allegheny and out towards Carlisle heading east. Uh, it includes Fort Niagara as well. Very important work by a very important scholar. And as I said, he's an architect who also does historical research. How do you defend Fort Duquesne? Well, the French were smart. They were unwilling to trust their fort to defend itself directly. They knew they had a totally inadequate facility. So they were not going to trust it to a siege. They were not going to trust it to an assault. Their method was really to defend the fort by fighting elsewhere through a forward defense. And then they would use the fort as, an, as a base to ambush the, adva the advancing British. Good example is the Battle of the Monongahela on the 9th of July, 1755. This was conducted by French who were badly outnumbered by the British. They sallied forth from Fort Duquesne to ambush General Edward Braddock's uh, army advancing up from Cumberland, Maryland, ambushed them, uh, drove them back. In fact, after Braddock's death, the British army retreated all the way to Philadelphia and went into winter quarters in August. Brave Sir Robin ran away that day. Hey, Jim, I'm just popping in real quick. We had a question about what was the name of that book recommendation again. The name of the book is Outposts of the War for Empire by Charles Morse Stotts, S-T-O-T-Z. And it's published by the Western Pennsylvania Historical Society. And I'll have an, a bibliography too at the end. But I got, right. my, Thank I got you. my copy at the Fort Ligonier um, gift shop, um, which is a good, good place to pick up books on the subject. But uh, I'm not sure if it's in print now. Believe me, I waited about 10 years to, to get a copy. So uh, <laughs> I'm not giving up mine. Fair enough. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Any other questions before we move on? Nothing at the moment. Cool. Okay. I, I'll throw them on the screen for you when they come in. Sounds good to me. Well, at the Monongahela, the... French pulled an ambush. They routed Braddock's army. Now, according to Fred Anderson, it, the route didn't happen at first, that they that the British fought very well. They broke up into platoons and actually suffered heavier casualties because they didn't run away, that they fought too, fought too long. Of course, Braddock was killed along with the French commander, and his successor who took over just betrayed the army, betrayed the cause by running away to Philadelphia and going into um, winter quarters when they were more should have been more worried about heat stroke. And this was an incredible defeat that really shook the British government uh, by a much smaller force, I have to emphasize, about seven miles from Fort Duquesne, that if they had just continued for maybe three more hours, they would have won but the French and the, their Indian allies took that away from them. Superior British strength, 
two good regiments that had come up from the West Indies, defeated. Now, in the aftermath, the French exploited the victory in the customary Canadian manner at the time by conducting numerous Indian raids. Uh, Fort Duquesne was important, and so was the Indian settlement at Catani. And as I said, these went into eastern Pennsylvania. They went as far as South Carolina, that they really turned up the heat. They did not conduct a conventional exploitation. They didn't have the numbers or the strength for that, but they could certainly engage in some very destructive and disruptive uh, raiding. Typical asymmetrical warfare and very traditional to Quebec. Now, there's a second defense of Fort Duquesne that a lot of people don't know about. And again, this is a proactive defense. And it's the Battle of Grants Hill on 14 September 1758. Major James Grant led about 800 soldiers, and he was supposed to reconnoiter ahead of uh, General John Forbes' army, much larger, and um, basically do reconnaissance. And Fort Pitt, or Fort Duquesne, I mean, was defended by about 600 troops, uh, which is about 400 more than Grant thought. Now, Forbes was not exercising great command and control because he was extremely ill and would die shortly after uh, taking Pittsburgh. Uh, Forbes was probably terminal with cancer, and he was following his army on a litter while Henry Bouquet did the real work with the army. Henry Bouquet was uh, a local notable, you would say. He was not British. He was Swiss. He was a mercenary who served in the British army, was very effective, uh, spoke French as a first language, but uh, the British required that their Swiss officers be Protestants. And he was extremely effective, extremely skilled, intelligent, but he's kind of tainted today by the memory that he approved of uh, biological warfare with smallpox tainted blankets. But there's a, there's a street in Pittsburgh named after him, um, very important figure that uh, most Pittsburgh historians are familiar with. He was doing the real command here. Now, Grant got ambitious over-ambitious. He decided to take Fort Duquesne all by himself. He was going to lure out the garrison and ambush it, but instead he was ambushed and defeated. Uh, remember, the, the defenders here are mainly Canadians. They're good at this. This is their way of war. So when you try to ambush them, maybe it sounds ambitious, maybe it sounds good, but you're playing on their field to their strength. And he found out the hard way. He lost 342 men killed or captured, and Grant himself was taken prisoner and sent to Montreal. And I just found this out, too. I was talking to one of my doctors. She's from an old Southern family, and she told me one of the family's um, members, who was he's like a great uncle to her, great, 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 how many times, and it was a Virginian named Andrew Lewis. And he was captured here, too. And the family has correspondence, including a letter from General Bragg, General Bragg, General Braddock, uh, telling him, please don't tell me how to fight the French and the Indians. I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional. You're not. So Andrew Lewis had apparently given him some good advice that was rejected. Then he was along with Grant, have the same thing happen. And uh, Lewis was taken prisoner as well. They also launched a spoiling attack that about a month later in Fort Ligonier, about uh, 50 miles to the east, a uh, place that if you go to WBCs isn't too far away. It is well worth the visit, by the way. The French needed supplies because their, uh, supp their long supply line had been basically cut by the British taking Fort Frontenac, uh, about the location of Kingston, Ontario today. They needed supplies. Forbes was very well supplied, so let's go and steal them. Now, the British losses were much heavier than the French, really infuriating Bouquet because he was, in fact, other British officers were agreed with him. They were upset with the poor performance of the Americans. 
but still the, the, the French did not take the supplies. They went back to Fort Duquesne. And as Forbes' army approached on the 25th of November, the French blew up the fort and left. They went up the river to Fort Michaud and then up towards Fort Niagara. Now, what happened to this garrison was it was basically wiped out at the Battle of La Belle Famille in 1759 outside of Fort Niagara, which was besieged at this point by Sir William Johnson. And they tried to break the siege. They were defeated by the British and just about wiped out. And Fort Niagara fell shortly thereafter to the British. So this is really the end of the, of the French presence in the Allegheny Valley and terminating in Pittsburgh. They're gone, never to return. Any questions? Okay. Now, the fort that replaced this was a temporary work called Mercer's Fort on the banks of the Monongahela. And here again, we have uh, one of Stotts's excellent drawings. It's kind of crude, kind of a crude fort, palisades with uh, four bastions on the banks of the Monongahela. And typical of Pittsburgh in the winter, you can see ice flows. It's basically a small temporary placeholder facility. It plants the flag, not a whole lot else. And it's only there until they could complete Fort Pitt. It's very small, rudimentary, uh, worse even than Fort Duquesne. But then it doesn't have to be much better than that. It's to basically house a garrison and to also house the workers who were in the engineers who were building Fort Pitt. On the banks of the Monongahela, looking towards south side. And as the picture indicates, the garrison was affected by a brutally cold winter. Um, anyone that's lived here for any length of time can recognize that as, long, as well as the hot and humid summers. Now, this is an interesting thing. Mercer was you, Mercer. He was a Scottish officer who later served in the American Revolution as an American with, under George Washington. He was killed at Princeton. And his descendants include Johnny Mercer, the songwriter, and two kind of famous guys named George Smith Patton. Family connection here. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Samuel Weisert, was a German immigrant who was badly wounded in the Civil War, fighting the elder George Smith Patton, who was eventually killed in the war between the states. But uh, Hugh Mercer was considered a major hero of the American Revolution early on and one of Washington's more important officers. And here he is at a critical moment after the fall of French Pittsburgh. Fort Pitt was planned from the beginning. 1755, there's a British officer killed at the Monongahela and the French find this sketch on his person. And it's very much as for it looks very much like Fort Pitt as it was completed, but it's off center, off kilter, and leaning towards the Mon. Uh, but it's still a good indication of what the British wanted to do with the forks of the Ohio. And Fort Pitt is really the culmination of everything as far as fortification goes, it's the biggest, it's the most advanced. It's the most defensible. It's the first one I would really call a substantial fort, not just a hooch with a ring of trees around it, not just a temporary structure, and not just Fort du something like Fort Duquesne, which was never adequate. But they were planning this from the very beginning. Fort Pitt, under British control, was the largest and most expensive of all the frontier forts built by Britain in North America uh, because of its location, uh, its method of construction. This was not a wooden fort like all the others. This was made of earth, and it was fronted on the east side. The bastions were, and the curtain wall were uh, faced with brick, uh, which made it much more durable, not just against any, any enemy artillery that might show up, but also against the periodic catastrophic flooding that the point was getting. 
it had a very strong diplomatic role in strengthening the British position for negotiations at the end of the Seven Years' War. This is a really, really emphatic pointing of the flag, a sign we're not leaving. Uh, much more effective at that than Trent's fort at the beginning. And it's virtually unassailable by any force without strong engineering assets and siege artillery. I mean, saying that a fort is impregnable is like saying that a ship is unsinkable. You're really kind of defying the um, you're defying the gods here. But uh, I don't see how any force, say irregular Indians, would have any hope of ever taking Fort Pitt. They would have to do it by a coup de main like they did on smaller forts and during Pontiac's Rebellion. But there's no way an actual attack against Fort Pitt by Indians with any sort of readiness by the British that was ever going to succeed. Even a token garrison would probably be able to hold them back. So this is an extremely emphatic statement that they're not going to leave. It's also going to be very effective in case um, negotiations don't go quite so well. And there, there remains some sort of French presence in North America. Um, this is highly, highly important. Also, too, I should note, this is the point at which Pittsburgh gets its name. John Forbes, being a Scot, probably pronounced it as Pittsburgh, but he named it after William Pitt. He came, he saw, he went back to Philadelphia, and he died. But he's the one that gave Fort Pitt its name and also Pittsburgh its name. So you could say, too, that they were always envisioning a, a town at this site. And it's also one of the few positions not to be overrun by Indians in Pontiac's Rebellion in 1763. I hope the dog's not drowning me out here. Hush. Now, there was a siege, and I put that in quotation marks because no siege guns, no engineering, no attack. And this was during Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, Henry Bouquet, once again, we hear his name. He won the Battle of Bushy Run on the 5th of August, 1763, and on the 20th of August entered Pittsburgh. The forces that he faced had basically been taken from Fort uh, Pitt. They had, these were the Indians just outside. They moved east to near Jeanette, Pennsylvania, and is memorialized today as a state park. Hang on one moment. Cosmo? No. Yeah, never mind. Jack Russell, you know what they're going to do. But uh, they moved east. They ambushed um, They ambushed Bouquet. He, he had a hard time winning. Um, he defended a little citadel made of flower bags. And finally, his Scotsmen charged the Indians. And, you know, bayonets and claymores against guys not wearing too many clothes. You know how that's going to end. But this was a near-run thing. Now, while he's doing that, the British first used contaminated blankets and handkerchiefs for biological warfare against the Indians at Fort Pitt. They took blankets and handkerchiefs and other goods from the hospital where whites were suffering from smallpox, put them on the ramparts and let the Indians take them. Uh, this was later approved not just by um, Bouquet, but also by the British commander in North America, Jeffrey Amherst, architect of victory in the French and Indian War, but also the guy who provoked Pontiac's Rebellion, which we'll get into later. But this is a very infamous case of uh, biological warfare against natives. And again, a Swiss officer comes in. His name is Simeon Ekaye. He was the commander of Fort Pitt. It was really, I would say it started as... AKA's, AKA's, AKA's um, idea. Again, a Swiss, and this is interaction with the Indians, but in a very bad way. Now, I've got this drawing here. This is by Stotts again, a uh, great draftsman as well as an architect. And this is a composite of Fort Pitt. 
as shown in contemporary drawings and plans. Now, the one thing that's missing here from the drawings and plans of the time is that they never put the cannon embracers into the uh, drawings. Um, Stotts extrapolates here from other British forts, contemporary to Fort Pitt, uh, the slightly smaller uh, Fort Ontario especially. And this, this thing is huge. And here's an example. If you, if you can see towards the top, Stotts puts in the outline of Fort Duquesne in very light print. That's Fort Duquesne inside the square. So this highly important French post in North America, the real centerpiece of the French and Indian War to a large extent, that's whole reason for happening is smaller than this outer work, uh, this bastion of Fort Pitt. Uh, it's really striking how much bigger Fort Pitt is. You could probably take Fort Duquesne and drop it into Fort Pitt's parade ground and only hit a couple of buildings. Stotts also puts in the, the here where it says the low town, this is the second fort, which is still surprisingly small. If you come to Pittsburgh, this basically occupies the area where just, uh, just like one edge of Point State Park. Some accounts say it was longer, but I really don't think so. Now, inside the red square here, we have the outline of Mercer's Fort. This was never supposed to be the keystone of anything. This is just a place to put up the Union Jack, say we own this and um, set up the construction of Fort Pitt. Any questions? Okay. This is Stotts' plan of uh, Fort, uh, Fort Pitt as constructed. Uh, you can see the one bastion off to the right. That is <coughs> That was never completed. And as far as I know, and as far as Stotts knew, they never put any cannons in there. Also, the bastion at the top, the Monongahela bastion. And here we are basically looking southwest. Uh, that Monongahela bastion, that was, uh, th that was heavily damaged in flooding and never fully restored. So through much of its history, Fort Pitt was a formidable fortification, but it was really at 60% strength. And you can see, too, over towards the lower right, what they call the isthmus. This was a covered way for um, infantry to line up and protect the, the fort's uh, northern flank. Uh, this is a very strong uh, facility and one of the most ambitious that the, that the British ever built anywhere in North America. In fact, I would say that Fort Pitt was really only eclipsed by the Citadel in Quebec after the American Revolution, and that took decades to build. And by the way, the Citadel was still an active duty Canadian base. Now, Fort Pitt went under American control during the American Revolution. And although it was the headquarters for American forces in the, in the Western theater, its main site was for its main use was as a site for diplomacy with the local Indians and those in the Ohio country. It was severely damaged. It was also falling apart. They needed a lot of supplies, even under the British, to repair the buildings inside. And it was never fully repaired. And the worst flood occurred in 1762. And again, we still have these floods occasionally. But I would say that flooding was more of an enemy to Fort Pitt than anybody else, either Indians or the French who were never there. It was kept by the United States after independence as one of the few military posts maintained uh, in the early years after the revolution. And it was eventually decommissioned and all the salvageable goods sold off 
on the 3rd of August, 1797. And that's really when its history ends. <clears throat> now, its only visible re remnant today is a brick redoubt, the blockhouse on the western end. And for most of its existence, that was used as a private residence. It was finally restored by the Daughters of the American Revolution. They took the windows out, uh, restored it to its more 18th century appearance, and it's, it's still there today. There also used to be some of the footers and foundations uh, for the northern bastions of the fort. They were visible. They have been dug up by archaeologists in the 1950s. Uh, they have since been reburied with a stone outline put over them to show where the fort was. Uh, they were buried because the city of Pittsburgh wanted more space for music performances and also to there were low lives and small-minded morons who were vandalizing them. So I really don't mind that they were buried because this is the only way to preserve those relics. This is the blockhouse. No windows, no upstairs doors. This looks as it did more like in 1764 when it was finished. Now, to sum up, here are the chief roles of the forts at the mouth of the, at the uh, forks of the Ohio. The first was the establishment of military and political presence, showing the flag, demonstrating that you were there to stay. Interaction with the natives through trade, of course, from the very beginning with uh, Trent's fort. And this is typical of both sides' forts on the frontier including Niagara, which was a major French trading post. They even dressed it up. They dressed up the, the so-called castle there to look like a, uh, a civilian building so that the Indians would be more invited, invited to it. Also, diplomacy. This is particularly true during the, uh, the French period and also the American Revolution, where the Americans used it to hold councils with the Indians and sometimes sign treaties that they totally violated, of course. It's a commitment to defend, maybe not by manning the walls, but by putting out ambushes, putting out forces beyond the fort, that this is something worth defending. And I think that this is a message, not just to the enemy, but to your own troops, that here we stand, here we are based, this is worth fighting for. And then if the enemy gets close, you blow it up and go away, as the French did at Duquesne. And also, too, as a base for offensive operations. There's a story that the American commander at Fort Pitt in the American Revolution, I believe in 1777, petitioned George Washington to be allowed to mount an expedition to take Detroit. Washington vetoed it because he said, you're just going to lose and I can't take that risk. Our revolution will fail if you mount this offensive operation. But this is a sign that offensive operations were part of the role of the forts. And of course, we have a totally different kind of operation after the Battle of the Monongahela when the French let their Indians and their Canadians loose on the British frontier um, and let the scalps come home to Pittsburgh, that um, that this was a very important role, that they used this as a base for attacking the frontier, not just military, but also the settlers. Something, too, that is always under, uh, uh, it's always understated is that these forts controlled the land, not so much the water. You don't see water batteries like you, like you still have in Quebec. Uh, to at least deny the St. Lawrence uh, to an enemy Navy. You don't see that here. Most of the cannons are faced either to, uh, either to the east to defend against a landward um, attack, or they're directly on the short and obviously to stop in a, a landing there. But as far as sailing past it or paddling past, that never seems to come into consideration until Fort Pitt's built. That's the only one that has anything close to uh, water batteries. So the real, 
control here is of the land next to the river rather than the river itself. Those outer works, including the ones that um, covered up the old site of Fort Duquesne, those are the only ones that even start to look like somebody was trying to control the river. My final conclusion is that Fort Pitt was over-engineered for what it was supposed to do. Diplomatically, it was a success. As far as protecting uh, the new town of Pittsburgh from the Indians and Pontiac's Rebellion, it was a, a success, but it was over-engineered. Fort Duquesne on the other side was under-engineered. It was never adequate. In fact, right before the Battle of the Monongahela, the, the French actually considered tearing it down and building an, a new and larger fort there, but they figured that they would not have the opportunity under British pressure. And so they sort of forewent the, uh, the opportunity to build a bigger and better Duquesne II. And I'm not sure that they had the means to do it anyway at the end of this long supply line. But I do believe it's worth considering that neither fort was actually proportional to the needs. Fort Pitt did too much, was too expensive, and Fort Duquesne was never adequate. Surprisingly, the two smaller forts, the ones that really don't matter, may have been the most size appropriate. Uh, Trent's Fort, which was basically nothing and did nothing, and Mercer's Fort, which was always temporary. But um, if you look at it just in terms of um, cost effectiveness, maybe they were the best. But Fort Pitt was definitely the strongest, the most imposing, and you could say even the most successful, even though it lasted just a few decades. Uh, but that a lot of that was due to nature in the flooding, not due to enemy action. Now, here's my bibliography. I did use more than this, but the ones I would especially recommend, uh, Fred Anderson's Crucible of War is uh, an essential book on the French and Indian War in North America in general, putting it into a global context with the Seven Years' War in Europe. Uh, the First World War, by the way, because it took place in Europe, especially Germany, North America, Canada, and the United States that was fought in Cuba. Also, the British launched a amphibious expedition and took Manila. Uh, this is the first time, too, that you see a really global strategy from William Pitt, and it resulted in a major British victory. Uh, René Chartrand's uh, Monongahela, 1754-55. He's a very good scholar. This is an Osprey campaign book. Um, our friend Bill Melano knows him personally. Um, so he's a great guy. He's a French-Canadian with a great sense of humor who likes his beer. But he's a good scholar, and he made apparently multiple visits to Pittsburgh and western Pennsylvania to write this book. And it's a good one-stop shop to learn about the early campaign. Uh, Brady Kritzer's Fort Pitt of Frontier History is very good. Uh, that's one that covered the American years, especially for me. The Dictionary of Canadian Biography, um, which is good for covering the, uh, the French officers in the French and Indian War. Uh, Drums in the Forest is a very old book going back to 17, or 19, 17, 1958 in the Pittsburgh Bicentennial. And of course, Stotts' Outposts of the War for Empire. Definitely, if you can, get a copy. Slightly dated in some ways, but for the architecture and the engineering information, essential. So that's the end of my talk. Questions, please, in the time that we have left. Jim, actually, we don't have any questions that have piled up, but I, I have something for you that sure. is not from the audience. It's from me. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned a couple of times the idea of sieges versus conventional ways to take the forts. Given yes. that these forts were parked out in the middle of nowhere and, and were on the edge of the empire and were not necessarily guarding population centers or or any sort of, of settled and colonized land, what was the logistics plan for these forts to hold out over a longer term? 
or were these sieges sort of like 10 days before these guys ran out of beef jerky? They would have enough time to hold out longer, I would say. Because during Pontiac's rebellion, the, po the small population of Pittsburgh, many of them evacuated inside of Fort Pitt. And this was getting to be a productive farming area. And they also raised livestock. For example, where Fort where uh, McKees Rocks is today, the British were ra were uh, they were using that as pasture land for their horses. Um, you had the King's Gardens just outside of Fort Pitt, uh, which raised uh, food. Um, I think that Fort Pitt could have held out for a good long time, um, not weeks, but maybe months. Now, there was ex exactly one real siege in the French and Indian War. This was the British siege of Fort Niagara, and that was not taken by starving them out. This was taken by using Indians for circumvallation to keep it from being resupplied, the same role that like cavalry would have played in Europe. And the British did bring a, an actual siege train, which knocked a breach in the walls they extended the honors of war. The French accepted. It's your fort now. But that yeah. was, that was not starved out. That was that had a hole knocked in the walls. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that tends to work also. Yes. Um, you mentioned wilderness empires uh, or wilderness war as as a game where these things make an appearance. Uh, aside from liberty or death, which I'm not even sure goes that far west. The the coin game. I'm not sure that goes that far west. Yeah. Um, are, are there other games where people might find some of these forts appear, whether in the tactical or operational strategic level? Strategic level, anything on the French and Indian War. Okay. This was the whole reason for the war. Uh, at, uh, seven, in 1754, Washington and Indians with mm -hmm. him uh, killed uh, the brother of the French commander at Fort Duquesne at Jumonville, Gwen and really started the war in North America. Um, the Battle of Fort Necessity followed, and Washington had to surrender and admit that he had murdered a diplomat. He didn't know he was admitting it, by the way, because the French terms were interpreted in the middle of the night in a rainstorm on paper where the ink was bleeding by an interpreter who spoke French as a third language. He was Dutch. <laughs> and, you know, if you ever need a really accurate translation of French, I'm sorry, get, get a Frenchman or a Belgian or a Swiss. Don't get a Dutch guy. No. And that's, as and Washington signed off of this document that said, I am a murderer and I killed diplomats. And it, it, it kind of stuck with them for a while. But uh, any game on the French and Indian War will include Fort, uh, Fort Duquesne in it. Yeah, I, I just looked because I was curious. The uh, the map for Empires in America, the solo game from Victory Point Games, has Fort Duquesne along the Ohio Valley track on its way up to Montreal. Um, for those not familiar, Empires in America is one of the states of siege games where you have varying axes that all converge upon some particular center of gravity. In the case of Empires in America, Montreal is the center of gravity of the French presence in North America. And you are the French trying to hold off those those rapscallion Englishmen, and and the different tracks upon which folks can uh, the the British make their progress. There's the Upper Main track, the St. Lawrence track, the Great Lakes track, the Champlain track, and the Ohio Valley track. The spaces along it are Virginia, the Alleghenies, Fort Duquesne, and Oswego. On your way into Montreal. Mm -hmm. So, so Fort Duquesne is there, and it is it is one of those defensible positions that uh, that you got to fight your way through, um, or or in the case you're you're playing the French, one of the ones you've got to defend as the English are trying to converge on as well. Yeah. So, now, just I guess Cosmo wants to chime in here, huh? Yeah, he does. Uh, is he trotting me out? Because not uh, bad. There's not much I can do being a, him being a Jack Russell. Yeah. Well. But, well, one of the things, too, is that the French were always challenged logistically. And it wasn't just the fall of Frontenac that affected their presence in the Ohio country. Uh, remember, in the other end, Louisbourg fell. And then in 1759, um, Quebec fell. And the French never were always dependent on supplies from Europe. 
they could no longer get them. They were based out of Montreal at that point, and they did almost retake Quebec in the Battle of San Foy. But they, um, but without Quebec, without Louisbourg, they were cut off, and it was really just a matter of time by then. And if they hadn't abandoned uh, Pittsburgh in 1758, they certainly would have had to do so with the fall of Quebec. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we're, we're just about out of time here and we don't have any other questions that have popped up. I did want to ask the logistics question because, you know, look, I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do want to thank Jim for coming over here and giving us a great history lesson on, on basically fortified Pittsburgh and, uh, and, and, you know, something near and dear to his heart. Cause you know, it's his backyard. Um, yeah. So the, uh, we, we want to thank Jim for swinging by the ACDC again. Absolutely. It's great to have you. Always a pleasure. Um, for those of you curious, what else is going on with the ACDC this weekend? Um, no field trip to Pittsburgh. I'm sorry. Virtual convention. Everybody's at home in their pajamas. Uh, next time we'll all go crash on Jim's couches though. Of course. And, uh, <laughs> um, but coming up at, uh, at, at four o'clock Eastern. So an hour and change from now, uh, we've got the winners for the Wargame Graphic Design Contest. And, and we didn't have a ton of entries, so we just sort of declared co-champions. Co and we're going to be talking about uh, taking, taking a look in, into the analysis of what people did well and poorly and what, what we liked, what we didn't like. Uh, we've got a couple of industry experts in the graphic design world going to be popping in to help us with that. So, so that'll be kind of fun. Uh, in the meantime, plenty of games still to play. Hope you guys all get a chance to register and join some of those. And, uh, and, and I guess, Jim, next virtual convention, you're going to have to make it because it's become tradition now. Will do. It's my, it's my pleasure. And you're not one to violate tradition. So, <laughs> no, of course not. It, you know, the one thing I, f I forgot to mention, you know, I used to work on the site of the battle at Grants Hill. Well, because isn't that where the first National Bank of Evil is? Oh, yeah, that was uh, Evil too. That was uh, the old Union Trust building and the Allegheny County Courthouse is just across the street. They tore down the hill uh, about uh, about 120 years ago because uh, it was kind of, they called it the hump. It was interfering with traffic on Grant Street. But that's one battlefield I actually worked on for eight and a half years. But, of course, I was doing evil at the time. Yes, yes. As opposed to now when you just do evil from your living room. Yeah, that was evil for not so much fun and no profit. Now it's just evil for fun and profit. There you go. All yeah. right. So uh, for those of you watching live, thank you very much. For those of you watching on recording, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and we hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll see you guys next time. I enjoyed it too. Thank you.